Welcome into the Commitment Issues Podcast. This is going to be the worst sounding edition of the Commitment Issues Podcast, maybe in the history of the world. Uh, I have waiting for my new Yeti microphone to arrive here in Miami from Amazon, and Woody has broken his Yeti microphone. Uh, so we're going to sound like crap, and um, you're going to either have to deal with that, <laughs> and hopefully we'll be back on track next week. Woody, how are you doing, man? I'm good. I don't. I, I don't know if we could say I broke my microphone, as it's a USB malfunction. So, uh, Yeti, which is a will, <laughs> will be hearing from me once we once we get off uh, the phone, because that's how we're actually doing this podcast this week. So we'll be on the phone with them uh, f- with some angry uh, rants and recommendations go- coming their way. Yeah, maybe we'll save the the Yeti rant for the end of the podcast. We can move in to the breaking news of the day. Actually, uh, we're recording this on Wednesday and. Uh, On the day that we're recording this, you guys won't hear it until a day from now, but on the day that we're recording this, Jake Bentley, uh, the 250, the Rivals 250 quarterback from Alabama, has announced that he will not wait until 2017 to join South Carolina, to which he is committed, and instead reclassifies to 2016, graduate from high school a semester early, a year early, uh, and then enroll at South Carolina this summer. Uh, What do you you make of that? It's kind of an awkward move even, or, you know, a different kind of move even by recruiting standards. Well, we've seen it happen in basketball in years past where guys reclassify. And I think, you know, the interesting thing about uh, this year in Bentley is that, you know, it's, it's, it's a situation where it popped out of nowhere. This wasn't like a lot of these, these kids. I mean, I know there's a player down in, in uh, Florida, Mark Pope, who talks to you all the time about how he's in the 2018 class or not 2019 or whatever. And then we have... Uh, we had Mark Walton, the running back from Booker T. Washington a couple years ago, who was re- trying to reclassify, trying to reclassify, and there was a lot of back and forth drama going on. All of a sudden, Bentley just pops up on Twitter and says, yeah, guess what? I'm starting school <laughs> in a few months. <laughs> yeah, surprise. Uh, so this is a kind of thing, and then the, the reaction on social media from other recruits has been really surprising. A lot of them, I, I don't know, angry. A lot of them are like, how is he doing this? I saw Amari Rogers, the Clemson commit, just retweeted it and said, huh? <laughs> yeah, they're all like taking it as an affront to them, you know, like <laughs> as if like they're stuck in this high school prison and Jake Bentley has found a way to escape. Uh, so I think that's kind of why they're they're taking things hard. Um, but people don't well, yeah. seem to, people don't seem to understand it, I think, because you see it happen, and you usually see it happen in the opposite direction, right? It's usually a kid like Ronald Patterson, who uh, you know was from Jacksonville in last year's class, retrain was supposed to be a 2016 reclassified to become a 2017 uh, and is going to graduate now, you know, a year later. You see that happen a lot with guys, and you saw that happen with, like, Calvin Ridley, I think, uh, back in the day. Well, you you sort of you sort of accidentally said skipping a semester, which, you know, Bentley was on track to graduate in December. So I think probably what he did, you know, was just take, you know, more online classes this spring, and then he actually is finishing only a semester early. So – I think, you know, I think when I graduated college or when I graduated high school, I was really mad because I realized I had taken seven classes too many uh, <laughs> because the, the high school, they don't tell you it's, it's built up for you to fail multiple classes during your career. So, you know, I was under the impression that that uh, that I needed to take all these classes. I ended up taking seven classes too many. I could have taken almost a whole semester off or graduated early, which wasn't even a thing uh, when we were in high school, now almost half of every recruiting class does it. So, but this is unprecedented, I think, for especially a quarterback, a four-star quarterback, a marquee guy to to graduate early and then go to school early, which we we just we just don't see it. I've, uh, this is I think this is the first time it's ever happened. Yeah, I talked to Jake today, and he said that you know only he only had to take one more com- extra computer class in order to graduate early, so it wasn't like a pile of new work. However, that worked out, and he also said you know it's. He wants to be at South Carolina and that, you know, he feels like this is a good time for him to strike while the iron's hot, to get in there and compete. South Carolina is going to have a quarterback competition no matter what. Uh, now Jake Bentley thinks he's going to be a part of that and might have a chance to actually, you know, win some significant reps. If it's not the starter's job, maybe it's the backup role. Uh, but he thinks, you know, getting there now gives him the best chance to kind of get in there and play. Well, I was reading on uh, Gamecock Central, which is our South Carolina site, 
very uh, comprehensive coverage there all spring long. And Brandon McIlwain, a, a highly debated four-star quarterback from last year's class that I think went from three to four stars like nine different times during <laughs> during the ranking cycle because uh, we could never uh, agree on his ranking. He was actually running with the number ones during spring practice because uh, a couple other guys, Lorenzo Nunez was hurt, you know, former four-star Connor Mitch, I think was dealing with some stuff. And then, uh, of course, uh, you know, Perry Orth was dealing with an injury. So you're looking at a situation where if he can get there by June, he's going to step right in. Like you said, he has a chance to start. I mean, this is going to be crazy to think that this kid who would be starting uh, his senior year of high school could be starting in the SEC. I, I think if I'm a South Carolina fan, I'm excited he's getting there, but it makes me a little nervous about where things stand with the quarterbacks right now. Yeah, and speaking of where things stand with quarterbacks, this opens up a whole nother row of 2017 quarterback dominoes, which we've covered on this podcast extensively. But now all of a sudden, South Carolina doesn't have a 2017 quarterback, uh, and they're looking around again. So this could trigger another round of things. And you know, I know they've already reached out to Mac Jones, the Kentucky commit. I confirmed that with Mac today. Uh, they have not offered him yet, but that was you know within 20 minutes of South Carolina or or Bentley announcing the news that he's going to roll early. Mac Jones had been contacted, at least, by South Carolina's offensive coordinator. So I don't know what's going to end up happening there, but I think South Carolina is definitely in the market for another 2017 quarterback now. Yeah, and I I still wonder, what are they doing at the position? What is the ideal fit for them? Okay, when they were at Florida, uh, they recruited Treon Harris as the ideal fit to play in what was supposed to be a spread offense. Now they bring in Bentley, who, who, you know, especially when he was younger, uh, which is weird to say because he's only like 17, uh, you know, before he had a few knee injuries, could, could run around a little bit. And then, but but McIlwain, you know, same same kind of situation. So do they want a dual threat guy? Do they want a pro style guy? I, I'm really curious to see what their offense is going to look like. And like you said, now other fans are like, oh, who cares about South Carolina? And guess what? This could you know, South Carolina could end up taking another quarterback in 2017 that all of a sudden, you know, flips from another school and the, and the dominoes continue to fall. So um, I think I think it's probably enough on on Jake. But boy, what what a weird day. And like you said, the, the, the social media reaction, I think it surprised both of us. <laughs> yeah, people, I'm telling you, man, well, Twitter is a good place for outrage over anything, right? So this is uh, this shouldn't surprise you too much. But the way it came out is like I saw somebody call it white privilege. <laughs> I mean, people are other high school students are uh, are a little bit salty at Jake Bentley right now for whatever reason. Yeah, I don't know. I, maybe <laughs> I have no comment on that. <laughs> but uh, speaking of quarterbacks, uh, let's let's transition over to Bailey Hawkman, uh, a guy that we have talked about on and off. He missed the Rivals Camp Series events this weekend in Atlanta to take a visit to Florida State, and as it turns out, he commits to the Seminoles on that trip. He was the only quarterback they offered in this class, and you know they, they're, their fans seem pretty excited about it. You know, he's a guy that that I've seen play several times. I mean, since his freshman year, lefty quarterback. He's a lefty. That, he, not uh, only is he a lefty, he's a long hair too, correct? Well, I can't. I think he cut his hair short. I mean, it's hard to say since I've never, you know, really seen him at any off-season events. He was a, he's um, a reformed long hair, <laughs> right? Yeah, he's a, he's a former he's a former long hair, but he, uh, you, you know, he, he's an interesting guy. He's an interesting fit for their offense. You know, his high school runs a uh, you know a spread option, which is obviously not what Florida State does. They like uh, you know more pro style guys, and he is a he is a passer first. But uh, I think there's going to be a transition period. I think this is a year where Florida State said, hey, we need to take a quarterback, but we don't necessarily uh, need, you know, one of these guys. We get, they got Malik Henry last year. They got DeAndre Francois the year before that, a couple of top 100 guys. So I like the fit of Hawkman there, but I, I just think, you know, not every – we know not every quarterback is going to be a, a four-year starter, and I think this is a situation where Hawkman can step in and wait for a few years and, and continue to develop. <laughs> reading this now as it comes in, not to go back to, uh, I just got a reply to my, my uh, Jake Bentley story from a football player in Tallahassee whose response to this story is just, LOL, yeah, okay, bro. <laughs> like, but they don't like believe him now? I, I don't know. It's I don't know. People are mad. Yeah, I got him. Well, Mark, it worked out for Mark Walton, as I said. He played last year for Miami as a freshman when he was supposed to be a class of 2016 recruit. So, um, Moving on to another quarterback thing I wanted to talk about 
briefly. Uh, this weekend we had the Rivals quarterback challenge in Atlanta. Uh, it was on Sunday, and we had a lot of young quarterbacks there. Two guys that that are you know sp- of important interest to me is uh, Trevor Lawrence, who uh, is one of the top quarterbacks in the country for 2018. He's and he a, is a ridiculous. He, and he is a confirmed long hair. Yeah, he is definitely. I mean, you know, he's one of these guys that he walks into a room. Even you know the the uh, the registration people were, were had jokes about his hair and everything like that. You know, speaking of which, is a mini mini rant. Can we stop calling every white quarterback with long hair shun- sunshine? I mean, uh, yeah, I haven't heard anybody sing- do that. I, I mean, I I mean, obviously, I thought it, but I figured that was so played out that people have, have gotten over. Yeah, it. it's so played out. I, I mean, it's every. If, uh, trust me, I've heard it for at least nine quarterbacks in the past three classes, so let's retire that nickname. Nope. And the second guy we wanted to talk about is Emery Jones, who also has long hair of a different variety. Uh, he had a v- pretty impressive braids. I was I actually wanted to talk to, <laughs> talk to him about it, <laughs> how, about how long it takes his uh, his mom or his hairstylist to, to get it to look like that. But, uh, you know, he's a... He's a dual threat guy, a guy who's who's very talented, showed great arm talent at the event. Now these two guys really are crossing over to the same schools. I think if I had to make a pick today, I would say, you know, Emory Jones is going to go to Tennessee. He told I I went up to him and I said, hey, where are you going to commit? <laughs> he said, oh, probably Tennessee. <laughs> you, you you always love when people are straightforward like that. I think sometimes the kids are thrown off when you just ask them like that, especially when it's not in an interview situation. Yeah. But, of course, Tennessee fans are hoping that they get Trevor Lawrence. Now, the same goes for Georgia. The same goes for Clemson. They're all sort of jumbled. And the same goes for Florida. They're all sort of jumbled up together. You had a chance to see Well, yeah, and Alabama also wants Trevor Lawrence, but I don't think that they'll be getting him correct. Right, you know, and Emory Jones visited there uh, right after the camp. So you had a chance to see them both. Do you, what, do you, what did you think? Do you have a preference? Do you, you know, based on schematical fit at those schools, or who do you think would be best suited to go where? I, I you know, depending on what we're going to see from Georgia uh, under the new coaching regime, I, you know, I really think that that would be a real good fit uh, for Lawrence. I think that he fits in well there. I don't know that he will end up there. Uh, I have no insight to Trevor's recruitment. He's from your state. You've talked to him more than I have. Uh, but on the limited you know, the limited snaps I've seen him take, and, you know, you don't see a lot in that quarterback challenge really uh, throwing at targets. Uh, but he seems like a guy that can sit back there and, and do what Georgia wants to do. Yeah, it's interesting. I've never heard – Trevor Lawrence is one of these guys that every single fan base is 100% positive they're getting. It's not even, it's not even like, hey, we need this guy. Uh, the Tennessee fans uh, are definitely getting him, according to them. The Georgia fans also say the same thing. And uh, Clemson also, you know, very confident about their chances, at least their fan bases. I think there's no way that these two go to the same school. I think if I'm Emory Jones, it depends because, you know, Tennessee has been kind of looking for a, a dual threat guy. They got Jared Guarantano. We've seen Josh Dobbs run around a lot. I think, uh, you know, based on if I were comparing Jones to Dobbs, I think Jones is a lot farther ahead. Uh, in his development than Dobbs was at this stage, but uh, so I, I don't think you can you can miss out. The question is, does Tennessee try to hold off on Jones because they want Lawrence, and then next thing you know, Jones ends up somewhere else. I think it's it's a real fine line with these quarterbacks, as we've seen Alabama empty-handed right now in 2017. They don't have anybody. But they lost. They missed out on Hawkman now too. And it yeah, was all you, because and of, I think uh, you can afford to do that more when you're in Alabama because you're the defending national champion with the mystique, with the pull. You can flip somebody from the West Coast even if you have to. Um, Tennessee doesn't have that luxury as they haven't really posted the success on the field right now. So I think you know if I'm Tennessee and I'm not, if I'm anything lower than 95% sure on Trevor Lawrence, uh, I might cut ties and take what I can get right now. All right. Because so, Jones so isn't a bad option. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a very good quarterback from everything I saw this weekend. It's no, not, it's I, not I as mean, the drop off is, I, I don't think it's as this, the drop off is drastic. I was really impressed with Jones. I, I really liked him. Uh, he, he's exciting on the field, you know, and then he, he actually, you know, really did an excellent job at the, at the camp as well. So now speaking of the state of Alabama, I wanted to talk to you about this. We had, uh, your boy, uh, linebacker, Will uh, Ignat uh, come out and announce uh, a top 10? I'm trying to think of how many times he's announced a top list. Um, 
I just think for it, man. I mean, at the end of the day, he came out and said Georgia leads, which, you know, it makes me, I don't know, it gives me Ben Davis syndrome where it seems like an outright falsehood. Um, I don't I remember. Do you remember when Ben Davis went on the Georgia Leeds tour <laughs> and nobody believed him? Um, I have a hard time believing this thing. Not, I think that he's going to stay in the state. I think it will be Auburn or Alabama. Yeah. That, that was my question for you. Do you, how much do you buy into this? And will any, you know, I wanted to kind of run down the list. Will any of these top players leave the state of Alabama? We've seen, Michigan try to get in there. Obviously, Georgia now with uh, McIlwain there is, is trying really hard. But do you do you think you think it's all just uh, do you think it's another Ben Davis situation where he's kind of trolling? Uh, yeah, trolling I, the, I think uh, that the fans it, a little it bit. Not is a Ben Davis situation. I think that you could get Malcolm Askew out of Alabama. Uh, he's so hard. You want to talk about a guy that's really soaking up the attention? Uh, you know, naming crazy things like top twenties that nobody pays attention to if they're if they know better. Uh, and just kind of never naming a favorite, pandering to whoever he's interviewing with, pandering to every fan base. He's tough to get a read on. I think that he may leave the state. I don't know where. Maybe Clemson's a player. Uh, you know, maybe some other schools are too. But I think as far as like your Ignat, he's going to stay home. I think your Henry Ruggs, the wide receiver, the speedy wide receiver from, from uh, Montgomery, is going to stay home. Uh, obviously, Brian Robinson, who's committed to Alabama already, is going to stay home from Tuscaloosa. So the real top guys, it's going to be hard to get them out of the state, I think. Yeah, but I would be surprised if Askew didn't go to uh, Auburn. Uh, I I just don't think he's a defensive back. I think he's an offensive guy, and I think that's the best fit for him. So if we if we run down, let's let's we'll do a quick rundown of the top ten of in Alabama. Nico Collins. I think we're assuming he's going to go to Alabama. Yeah, I think that's a fair assumption. Okay, Askew. Like I said, I would pick him for Auburn. You said I see, maybe he, he, he goes might somewhere be able to, yeah, He I think maybe the state. But it, will that be on his own choice, or will it be because he's not a priority of those two schools? It might be because he waits too long. The way that he's playing his recruitment right now, he is not – he may – I mean, right now I think that he's probably a take, but I think that he is one that has – weights himself out of being a take written all over him. Uh, we saw this with so many prospects. We saw this with Pi Young in Florida last year who favored Michigan the whole process and weighted himself out of being a take and now ended up at USC. Uh, I think Malcolm's got that written all over him. He's going to try and wait and wait and wait until it might be too late. Okay, Brian Robinson, he's from Tuscaloosa. He's he's acting like he's going to take visits. I wouldn't even be surprised if he decommitted at some point, but I can't imagine a, a six foot two six foot one two hundred twenty pound running back from Tuscaloosa uh, okay. not being in. <laughs> uh, Austin Troxel, who's the uh, the big offensive lineman who's injured right now. I can't. I don't think he leaves the state, right? Yeah, unless they pull off of him because of the injury. People want to see what happens post knee with him. Um, you know, as a lineman and a knee injury, things can get difficult. He missed most of the season last year. Nobody really knows what he's going to come back as. So, uh, if he comes back as the same player, though, I can't see him getting out of the state. Uh, Henry Ruggs. We said you think he stays. Uh, offensive tackle Kendall Randolph, who who was not at the camp this weekend, I don't think. Uh, but but as you say got to be Alabama. <laughs> you look at his profile and every single article is from <laughs> Alabama or Auburn. So think, um, and then Alaric Williams, the number seven player in the state's committed to Auburn. Number eight, Chadarius Townsend committed to Alabama. Number nine, Ryan Johnson, who's a guy that I was really hoping to see this weekend. He didn't make it. Uh, I've, you know, there's a lot of proms going on in Alabama, which actually hurt our camp. Yeah, no doubt. But I mean, I, what do you think? I, I guess the larger question is, though, and maybe this is more entertaining for people and more interesting, is what is it about that state? Um, you don't find it in very many other states. I, I mean, it is so hard to get a guy out of there. Maybe it is the success of Alabama, but even when they were down, it was difficult. I, is it a different culture, do you think? You know, I've been there, and football is – people like to say football is different in Texas and Florida, but it's different in Alabama in a different way, I think, whereas, I mean, people see it as, you know, it's, it's blood wars there. You know, it's treason <laughs> if you leave the state of Alabama and you're a top football player. They, they've somehow made it in the culture there to where these kids just don't really even entertain the thought, if they don't have to, of leaving that state. Well, it, it's interesting because it's a small state, but it has a, a lot of football talent. I know the Georgia fans are always uh, always on us because of a uh, population ratio. How could there be three five stars in Alabama when Georgia has ten times the population or whatever. You know, unfortunately that's not how it works. New York City is not producing any five stars. Uh yeah, you know, there's a lot more there's a lot more people there than there is in Mississippi. Um 
So I, I, do, I do think it's hard. I think you'll see schools like, you know, Michigan – pluck out a couple guys, Arkansas, the lower tier guys. But I think if a guy has a chance to go to Alabama or Auburn, I think they just grow up rooting for the two schools. It's just, like you said, it's a way of life. And it's and the people there tend to stay longer. You know, the city of Atlanta, you have people moving in and out from other places. And that's why maybe, you know, the, the, the Bulldogs don't have the same allure. They lose some guys. I mean, people expect them to get every in-state guy. It's impossible, Plus, especially it- considering... Is there something yeah. to not having a professional sports team in proximity where the Crimson Tide and the Tigers become not only they don't know, they, they don't just fill the role as the you know the college favorite they also fill the role as the professional team in the region I mean it's just a larger than life ordeal I think there's something to be said for them not having any pro football team anywhere near them uh, something to be said about that for sure. Well, so we've seen schools try to crack in there, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, satellite camps. Boy, what a what a talking point. Everyone's got an opinion. It seems like, I think, well, what are we waiting on? The NCAA is going to make some type of ruling whether they can or can't do them coming forward, and, and the SEC, the SEC's ban on, on their own satellite camps is coming up in a few, I think, at the end of May, so... What is the latest on this one? And I mean, do, are we hearing? Is what's the NCA going to say? I don't think they care, do they? No, I think everybody's expecting it to remain legal to do, and I think it's going to affect Rob Cassidy and Woody Womack more than anybody else because yeah, everybody geez, wants to have don't. these camps in our backyards. You know what that means? That means we have to go to them. Uh, so in a region where there's already a camp or a seven on seven every weekend in the off season for you and I to cover, we will now have to cover school camps. Uh, from schools like Michigan and the like uh, that unfold now in our backyards. Okay, so th- now this is perfect because you got to come to the camp in Atlanta this weekend and you did defensive top performers and you included Michael Allen and Tyler Taylor on the top 15 list, right? I love, that Tyler, I love that Tyler Taylor kid especially, man. I really liked him. Okay, so both of those players were at Nebraska Satellite Camp Last summer, which was the hottest camp I've ever been to, which is pretty impressive considering I go to camp, I lit, our job is to literally stand outside in burning hot sun all summer. Uh, neither one of them had an offer. Both of them dominated that camp. I went back and looked at my write-up. They were both in there. I was talking about how they were both going to be stars. Guess what? They both left that camp without an offer from Georgia State or an offer from Nebraska. Nebraska just didn't offer them. And now they have long lists of offers from Power 5 schools, and they dominated you know, a very, very like highly contested rivals camp. It's because they get lost so, in the shuffle, right? The satellite camps are cattle calls. And so it is impossible to watch all 400 players that show up at the satellite camp, and guys like Taylor, who is an extremely talented and good-looking prospect, uh, can easily get lost, right? That's the only explanation for something like that. Yeah, I mean, this was in... <laughs> But but it's it's insanity really because you you just it's just a waste of time then why even have them I mean I'm going back through I'm I'm, I'm trying to go back through and look at the list um, <laughs> I, just, I said he's got a six foot eleven wingspan okay I took a vine Tyler of him Taylor and we can does. put this on the we can put this on the uh, the podcast Twitter account with his six foot eleven wing, wingspan extended and jumping out of the building well you know jumping you know 10 feet off the ground to catch a football uh while playing (laughs) while playing defense i don't know how they missed this well so you see so it's not a situation where it's like where it's like oh hey you know we didn't know he he blended in with the rest they they measured the kids six foot eleven wingspan i mean he's like you know kevin durant or something which you know speaking of which i'm kind of mad at myself he's actually a mid three star right now even though I, you know, I should have just pulled the trigger and ranked him higher, but you know, like I said, Mike Riley was standing right there watching him. And do I, you know, do I know more than Mike Riley? I don't know. That's that that remains to be seen. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sure the Nebraska fans will appreciate that one, but um, it, but that that kind of scared me off. I was like, well, well, you know, Nebraska's entire coaching staff watched this guy work out, and they didn't offer him. So is he a four star? Um, now in ret- now in retrospect, like you said, he's got 30, 30 offers. This you know Michigan did take a couple of guys on on the circuit last year, but I think you know our our good friend of the podcast Tim Sullivan had sort of let us know ahead of time that these commitments were essentially planned. They were players that Michigan had already identified and had planned to offer or planned to accept their commitments. So um, I I think they're a waste of time, and I I don't think you know. 
I don't think Georgia needs to have a satellite camp in Atlanta. I mean, Georgia's dog night camp, you know, was one of the most ridiculous things I'd ever attended last year. Nick and I had sworn off ever going again because there were so many people there and it was such a mess. So, uh, you know, I don't know, Rob, how many of these do you think we're going to go to, you know, f- f- this summer? Do you, do you think you're going to go make a priority to go to them? Because I, I really, especially after I got into a big argument with uh, the NCAA lady last year at the aforementioned Georgia State camp, I don't, I don't know how many of them I'm going to actually go to. I, you know, because I'm a glutton for punishment, I always like to like search out things. I will go to the first couple probably until, and if it is a mess, like I expected to, I'll probably call it quits. Um, but you know, and then there are some schools that, you know, I, I will definitely go see, you know, you can't, if USC comes in the South, you know, they recruit this area so heavily that it would behoove me to go there regardless of what happens. But, uh, so, but we're going to have to pick and choose our spots. I mean, there's no doubt about it because, you know, the wonderful, you know, Adam Friedman and the wonderful Josh Hemholt who cover the mid Atlantic and the Midwest won't have to deal with as many as these because, you know, Auburn's not going to set up a camp in Iowa. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not happening here. Um, everybody's yeah, everybody's so. coming to Florida and Georgia. Uh, so it's going to be a Womack and Cassidy nightmare. Well, I'm I'm real mad about it. As I tweeted about it yesterday, um, I'm I'm not super thrilled because then you have all these high school coaches. Hey, are you coming? We got Urban Meyer coming. It's like, yeah, I'm sure Urban Meyer is really concerned if I'm going to make it out to the camp or not. <laughs> um, he's gonna he's gonna really care. So, um, and hopefully there'll be some uh, in Texas as well. So uh, Nick Kruger can can. Uh, drag his butt out there as well and, and, and have a good time. So let's uh, let's toss it to the old uh, Texas Roundup, get the latest on Texas. Nick and I uh, talk about some of the biggest topics, including uh, Southeast teams recruiting Texas now all of a sudden. So let's uh, throw it to myself and Nick to talk Texas. Boy, rave reviews after last week, Nick. I know people were very excited to have you on. So uh, what, what's your exact t- – it's just Texas analyst, right? It's not Midlands analyst. Is that, is that right? Right, just Texas. All right, so just the uh, the Lone Star State, the Lone Analyst State, also uh, <laughs> as Nick Nick Kruger handles it himself. Uh, busy week down in uh, your neck of the woods, as always, and uh, we wanted to talk about a few different players now involving actually the SEC. We've seen, you know, obviously Texas A and M has success in the state, but other schools are trying to jump in there and recruit. Uh, kind of give us a rundown of, of, of one school we need to watch out for that's, that's really trying to push into uh, Texas. Well, after talking to a couple of kids at a couple of uh, camps, you know, one thing's pretty clear is that uh, Tennessee is actually, you know, one of the teams trying to make a push into Texas. You know, we've seen uh, like an Illinois and a California come in from other parts of the country and, and really make a uh, press with offers in the state. But uh, Tennessee factoring or keying in on a, Q, uh, a couple of guys, you know, real key guys that can be uh, factor type players for them. Yeah, so so um, one wanted receiver, we, we had your prediction piece a couple of weeks ago and you had two different players in there predicted for Tennessee kind of give us a rundown of why why you made those picks and if if that's been strengthened or or weakened based on the conversations you've had since. Well, you know, the the one guy that I talked to personally at the Rivals Camp Dallas was Grayson Reed. He's a four-star offensive lineman. Uh a guy that we had I think uh slotted in at tackle right now. Uh but is a guy is being is recruited as an interior lineman and uh he was he was good at our camp. Uh he's been he's been good at other camps so far this spring as well. Uh, but, you know, the thing that he said that uh, in regards to him in Tennessee is that they call him like every day are always showing him the love. And, you know, when I talked to him, I could see the look on his face. You know, it was he talked about Oklahoma. He talked about some of the other schools that ended up in his Big 12. But, you know, when he was talking about Tennessee, he had a real big smile about it and was, uh, you know, was very interested in, in whenever his next visit could be to get over to Knoxville. Another guy that, you know, we were talking about is Katie Nixon, who's a receiver at DeSoto. And he's taking a visit to Tennessee uh, on Thursday, actually. We're recording this on a Wednesday. So, you know, I'll follow up with him and see what he thinks about it. But, um, you know, he's a guy that has said he, he has a, a very positive relationship with the coaches over at Tennessee as well. And I know he's waiting on a few other offers. But um, in the meantime, it seems like Tennessee is the leader with him, too. So, you know, if they get, if they get just those couple guys out of, uh, out of Texas that we've been talking about, you know, a couple of four-star guys, and, and that's all they got out of Texas, I still think that'd be a pretty big win for them. Yeah, and of course their backup quarterback, uh, Quentin Dormandy, I think is from Texas. I'm sure that's that's helping them. They have got a guy or two out of there every 
every other year or so, but uh, this would be big if they could land those two. Uh, another SEC team in the state of Texas, Texas A&M, had a big recruiting event, but uh, didn't seem to move the needle a whole lot. I don't think we saw any commitments coming out of there. What what was that? What was the feedback you got from the recruits you talked to, especially because you know they were billing this as kind of their marquee spring recruiting event? Yeah, uh, you know, you're talking about Friday Night Lights uh, last week in College Station, and yeah, I still haven't had a chance to talk to a ton of kids about uh, the experience. I know, I know the, you know, looking at the reactions of some of them, you know, they'll, they'll all say that they had a positive experience, but it's really strange that, uh, you know, that they. The Texas A&M didn't really close on anybody. We had Tate Martell, who we were talking about last week, actually tweeted out that you know if anybody was going to commit, he was going to give everybody a 20-minute warning, and then he was going to put it on Periscope. I mean, he obviously had big plans to try and help them uh, seal the deal on a few guys, and just you know nothing really came out of it. You know, we saw on uh, Aggie Yell, our, our rivals network site, you know the things that the uh, you know the writers said about the scrimmage itself. They just, you know, the reoccurring theme was there was kind of a lack of energy too. So I wonder if that, you know, had anything to do uh, translating to, you know, to the mood of the recruits and, and none of them really pulling a trigger there. Um, are you? Uh, what are, are there? Is there some trepidation, I guess, with their with their class, considering what we saw last year? Are, are people starting to negatively recruit them with the possibility of Kevin Sumlin maybe being a little bit on the hot seat? Is that something that's that's been discussed there at all? Well, the name that I heard from Texas A&M recruits most is uh, Coach Turner. Whenever he's involved with any of uh, you know the recruitment, you know of those guys, they all really like his energy. They all have, have a positive relationship with him. You know, I think I think there's not a ton of trepida- uh, trepidation, rather, in terms of you know how recruits feel about Kevin Sumlin. You know, I think the if there were any, uh, the reputation is getting more positive. You know, but the, you do see some of these other SEC schools. Uh, come in and make him play for uh, Manny Netherly, who's a four-star wide receiver uh, commit for him right now. And, you know, he just recently got a Florida offer. I know he's going to Alabama this weekend as well. And he's a big guy that we saw at Rivals Camp Series Dallas and, uh, you know, a good solid player. And it would be uh, it would be tough if Texas A&M weren't able to hold him either. Yeah, that would that's interesting to follow. The uh, we all know the Aggie fans love love it when the podcast makes it over to uh, the message board over there. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to make you start posting uh, that so so you can take the the angry uh, responses. But anyway, uh, Omar Manning, uh, tell us about him. I I know he seems to be somebody that that is a that is a big time name that a lot of different schools are in in on. What's the latest on on his recruitment? Well, you know, actually, I'm using this podcast as a platform to get Omar to, Omar to call me back here so we can do an interview. I got questions for him. You know, we talked a little bit on Twitter, and, uh, you know, he's not, get, he's not connecting with me on the phone right now. So, Omar, pick up the phone. We got some questions for you. You know, obviously, he's a guy that we saw at Rivals Camp Series Dallas, too, that was, you know, came in, muscled up, looked like a million bucks, played pretty well. It was a tough day uh, to catch passes out there and for quarterbacks to throw him, but... Uh, you know, I think he's definitely a guy that people have taken notice of, too. He was another guy that was supposed to be at Friday Night Lights uh, in College Station. So, you know, when I talk to him, I'll ask him about that and see if he can provide any more insight as to how that went. But, you know, like I said, Florida's in on him. Uh, you know, he's got a bunch of other offers from Oregon. Uh, Notre Dame, I believe, is another big one. So, uh, you know, he's really been or I'm sorry, not, <laughs> no, he doesn't have Notre Dame, but it might be coming because he's really been one of the hottest names in Texas <laughs> recruiting right now. <laughs> well, let's hope so. Let's hope Notre Dame jumps on. You know, Notre Dame actually has done a nice job of recruiting Texas. I know they got the, the big tight end out of the state. It's interesting to see Texas being an area where it used to be the top guys, you know, were settling on those in-state schools. And maybe you mentioned Oregon. They could pluck a smaller, you know, a, a Michael James type guy who who has size and or who has speed, but maybe not the size. We saw uh, James, or Jaquiz Rogers, excuse me, another small guy who went to Oregon State out of the state of Texas. But now it just seems like everybody is uh, is trying to raid the state and everyone thinks they have a good shot at landing the top guys. Yeah, you know, there's uh, there's been a couple guys that, I think when you see the turnover that uh, Coach Charlie Strong had on his staff, despite having a good recruiting class this past year, uh, you know, you, we talked early about the, the mood with the coaching staff at Texas A&M. 
uh, you know, certainly there's schools like Baylor and TCU that uh, do well in the state and have had a lot of stability with their their coaching staff. But when you talk about the other two big Texas schools involved, you know, maybe that's why we see a few other SEC teams come through uh, and try and, and try and work on guys that Texas A&M is making plays for. That's why we see, uh, you know, Big Ten and Pac-12 teams making a play for, you know, the schools that Texas would otherwise be interested in too. But there's still a lot of time left with a lot of kids' recruitments especially since we're you know, not even through spring ball yet. Uh, and there's a lot of schools uh, that, that have to visit other players. So you know, there's a lot of guys that are wide open, obviously a lot of talent to go around in Texas, though, too. What, what's the status of your move to Texas? How soon are you officially uh, in, in the Lone Star State? Well, I am planning a few trips there this month to uh, cover a couple of events. You know, I might be there multiple weekends, but uh, I'm still trying to get my move organized. So we're set to move in uh, May 7th. So you'll start seeing a lot more of uh, me in front of the camera interviewing kids and things of that nature when, uh, when I'm interviewing them out there as opposed to me begging for them to call me back on podcasts. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Nick. And uh, let's throw it back to Woody, myself, uh, for rants and recommendations. Now it's time for the the, uh, the best part of the podcast. I think the part that several of my friends have told me they just fast forward to uh, because they don't follow recruiting. <laughs> it's uh, rants and recommendations. So, so let's start with you. You were fired up today. I know you had something to complain about uh, and, and maybe something to recommend. So let's hear it. You know, Nick could have spoken to this too because, you know, I probably wouldn't have said anything about it if it wasn't a trend. Um, really long and short of it is that Taco Mac almost ruined my WrestleMania Sunday. Uh <laughs> Nick and I, uh, Nick is also a noted wrestling fan. We were going to watch WrestleMania in Atlanta. I ordered, uh, you know, we had the network. We had it set up in my hotel room because there was nowhere else to watch. And Nick was coming over and I ordered some hot wings from Taco Mac. And I went and sat down to pick them up. It took them over an hour to get, you know, 30 hot wings ready. And, you know, apparently that's not like an isolated incident thing either. Apparently, it's like the big knock on Taco Mac, if you go to the Yelp review or you ask Nick Kruger, is that they, uh, they take forever to do anything. And when it's in a crunch and it's something as important and sacred as WrestleMania Sunday, it's nothing to play around with, Woody Womack. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, I, I'm not the most impatient person. I'm not you. I don't freak out on everybody I see for no reason. Uh, but you can imagine the mood I was in when it was 10 minutes until the thing started and I'm sitting at a Taco Mac watching Suburban Moms drink seasonal Sam Adams. Well, first of all, you violated your own rule by going to Taco Mac, which is a mediocre uh, chain restaurant unless of course they want to sponsor the podcast in which my review would change but look man uh, yeah it is my own rule but i was in the middle of suburban atlanta for that camp it's not like there was a plethora of wing spots around i was in a pinch i needed to watch wrestlemania uh kruger was on his way over the closest thing was a taco mac i saw it it was in my crosshairs i engaged i went for it yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm I'm out on Taco Mac. I think we all went and worked there after last year's camp, uh, but I'm with you on that one. They're too slow, and you know the the food isn't uh, the food isn't super great. It's weird how you go to these places and they have this giant menu with thousands of items, and there's nothing I want to order. Well, what's on the it. deal with the name uh, there too? Like, why is it named that? Like, I I think people just assume it's like tacos and or macaroni and cheese or something, right? Like, is there like a story behind I, this name? <laughs> I always assume it was – when I had never been and I first moved here, I assumed it was a taco place as well. Uh, I don't know why it's called ta- – I think they have tacos on the menu, don't they? I, I don't know. I ordered wings and it took an hour. I mean I guess while I was sitting there for an hour watching Suburban Moms who were probably hopped up on Xanax, I probably could have looked over the menu. But I was just stewing, <laughs> just like staring at the taps and stewing. Yeah, I'm sure you were – I'm sure you <laughs> – I'm sure you were really mad. I texted I Kruger, and Kruger's like, Kruger's like, man, I could have told you not to do that. I mean, they're like notorious for this. I mean, it was an hour, and this isn't a, an exaggeration. I looked at my phone. It took an hour to prepare. It, you're just frying these wings. Well, it, it reminded me about... Uh, <laughs> reminds me about... Uh, you know why uh, my lunch experience, where I there was no food left by the time it came time for me to eat at uh, at uh, Saturday's camp, and somehow it was my fault that I was on the field working uh, and there wasn't enough food. So that that was a, that was interesting to hear me get scolded for not stopping to work and coming to eat, which that's a that's a that's a new one. So what? Uh, now, what do you have to recommend? I'm sure you have something. Yeah, I recommend positive. being in the same city as uh, the Sherlock Holmes convention. Um, I <laughs> it was I haven't seen the Sherlock show, but it, in Atlanta this weekend, I got put up in a hotel uh, with 
just, you know, in the Sherlock Holmes convention, which is apparently a thing that exists, there were 800 people there to come to celebrate their their fandom of the Sherlock Holmes BBC series. And it was all women. It was all like fangirls, uh, hipster types. It was really an experience. Everybody dressed up in fake beards and old timey detective hats. And I mean, it consumed the entire hotel. So everywhere you went and they were like solving murder mysteries and, and, and perusing the hallways and all the doors were decorated. It was, it, it was a fun hotel experience. And, you know, I get excited when I see people excited about something. Uh, and I'm the one to judge these people because like, I just spent 10 minutes talking about how much I love WrestleMania. So uh, I support their fandom and I, you know, I thought it was a really cool experience. Yeah. It, uh, I don't know. It's, uh... It's kind, of, it's kind of a weird. That's kind of a weird thing. I don't. I didn't really. Now, was it people into Sherlock the TV show? Or well, it was all was Sherlock. The, I talked to some of the uh, some of the fans, the participants, and they said it was a celebration of all things Sherlock Holmes. But the BBC show is really what attracted uh, the most people. I, mean, I guess it, it had gotten a lot bigger this year since the show had been out and popular. I guess last year there were only like three hundred people there, and this year there were six or seven hundred people at the convention. So, so evidently. So. <laughs> So going back to Taco Mac, according to their website, I, I, it's, which you know this is a poorly written story history of the company. According to them, some dudes moved from Buffalo to Atlanta to open a restaurant, and it's uh, this is what it says: the perfect location was found, but with limited funds remaining, a decision had to be made: renovate the kitchen or change the sign out front. What the kitchen one? And, yeah. The kitchen one and the Mexican Irish sounding name Taco Mac remained. <laughs> so there you go. I guess they must have bought a building and it already said Taco Mac on it. So and they, they were just like, it. well, you know, that's just you know, that's just a microcosm of the laziness that is making my food so slowly. I mean, <laughs> yeah. what are you gonna what are you gonna like expect from a restaurant that's like, well, there's already a name here. Yeah. <laughs> guess that's good. You know, this is my own yeah. fault. It's on me, Coach. I should have never went to the Taco Mac in a pinch. If I would have known how lazy that these people were about their name and, and other things, maybe I would not have gone in. Yeah, it's a stupid name. Uh, on to uh, my rants uh, this week. Actually, semi involves you. Uh, baseball season has started. I believe. Uh, yes, so you'll it be going has. to. Se- You'll be going to several games this year. So will I with uh, our friend uh, Nelson Seely, friend of the podcast, also known as El Montro, uh, getting a job with the, with the New York Mets. Yeah, he's now my and, new uh, best friend. He's <laughs> <laughs> also Rob's new best friend. He's, uh, he's given uh, Nick and I tickets to go see the Marlins before uh, when he worked there. He worked at ESPN, and uh, now he's working for the Mets. Uh, the, the issue I have, you know, we all know that I've soured on baseball over the years. I'm really enjoying the make baseball fun again movement though, because I, I've been saying that for at least 15 years. Um, but boy, live tweeting baseball games is back and I'm issuing a warning. If you're going to live tweet a baseball game, I'm going to unfollow you. I don't care if it's Marissa Mayer, the CEO of Yahoo. We don't need to know, like you know, we, we don't need like tweets like "Hey, need a hit here." Yeah, but I mean, that's like just that. that's just nobody. I mean, nobody nobody does that. I guess people do that, but nobody nobody with any sense does that. I mean, with no context. Now, I can understand live tweeting the World Series or a playoff. Well, game, no, no, it, it, but nobody's right. watching. You know, I, and I love the Mets as much as anybody. I watch probably 110 Mets games a year, but you're never going to see "Hey, need a hit here" with no context. Um, <laughs> well, here's the thing. I mean, here's wait, the nobody th- even knows what you're talking about. <laughs> here's the thing. I know. Believe me, I know. But you, because I live in Atlanta, and the crossover, you know, I guess, I guess it has to do with the, with TBS or something. But every single person on the entire earth is a Braves fan. Yeah, that team I is guess. so bad right this year. That's like a minor league. I mean, they are going to set records. Okay, for, well, for bad. Well, so every game is just somebody live tweeting. You know, oh. You know, need friggin' who will, Nick Markakis. Is he on the team? Is that someone that's on the team? Did I make that up? That, that's a person that exists <laughs> in the baseball universe. <laughs> Does he play for the Braves or no? <laughs> yeah, he plays for the Orioles. Or no, he plays for the Braves now. Oh. All right. Okay. All right. So I right. I only know him because he's Greek. Uh, so that would be uh, someone who's on the Braves. And uh, regardless, we don't need the tweets. And I will unfollow you. And I don't want to hear it from anyone when I do unfollow you because it's like, guys, I. I you know, I, I've been known to, like last night, I was watching the Warriors, uh, 
the Warriors and Timberwolves game went to overtime. And I was tweeting some out of context tweets about the game, but that was at 1.30 a.m. And it was, you know, my entire Twitter feed was watching the game. So like you said, the playoffs, the World Series, I'll cut you some slack because that's what Twitter's for. It makes it fun when uh, everybody's watching the sporting event together. But geez, oh my lord, I, we can't do it. It's 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 April. We can't go. I can't handle six more months of you need a hit here or whatever. So you 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 have been warned, uh, people who probably don't listen to this podcast. Who I guess I only follow under other media people, which is also weird to me that you know you you were in Atlanta and you cover Atlanta sports and and then you're cheering for the Braves openly on Twitter which is a, a weird thing so let me uh let, let, let me before we go I want to touch on what my favorite baseball story of the week right now because it's just so awesome um me being the Mets fan I am and, uh <laughs> so the 1986 Mets team has a well-deserved reputation of being like party animal scumbags you know, there's been books written about them. But somehow this slid through the cracks of the books and came out yesterday in Ron Darling's new book. He has written about <laughs> – this team before at-bats was – they would take amphetamines before the game and they were known as white crosses, right? So they would take these amphetamines and they would start wearing off by the eighth inning. So – and in quotes, re- to re-kick the bean as somebody on the team called it, Darling chronicles how – these players would shotgun beers before at bats to get the amphetamines going again. So they were focused in. Could you imagine this happening today? A baseball team doing shotguns of beers in the locker room and then coming and taking it at bat. Well, and that's the thing that makes me so mad about, you know, Mike Schmidt or, you know, who have, you know, goose Gossage, who, who has one of the all time epic flip outs, which you can find on YouTube, which I really enjoy uh, acting like, Oh, we, these guys don't have any class. And it's like, so you know that would that would be my recommendation this week. Go watch that Goose Gossage rant <laughs> on YouTube, <laughs> where he freaks out when he was a player, um, and it's very it's very funny to watch. Plus, you you know this guy went by Goose as his name, and he's telling other people that they don't act serious enough. I mean, come on. Yeah. Meanwhile, this whole team is shotgunning beers and doing lines of cocaine in the clubhouse before I pass. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. So that uh, that about does it for us. Please follow us uh, on Twitter. I'm at Rivals Woody. Nick is, or Nick is uh, at Rivals Krug City. He decided not to shorten that, uh, so he kept keeping that nickname that that he's been carrying forever. Rob, your Cassidy underscore Rob still no yes, no, still, no update. Nah, still trying to fight with old Rob Cassidy, who's tweeted seven times about finding his long lost sister. Or whatever. Yeah, well. <laughs> And please leave us a review on iTunes. And uh, we're almost we're almost back in the flow. We we uh, we we're, we're finally gonna be back to a regular schedule. Well, I'll have and, my new uh, microphone next week, and your microphone will be working again, so we don't sound like we're doing a podcast from the moon. Right, exactly. So, M Deuce, uh, go ahead and uh, and play us out. Mm-hmm.